years of trusting him and following him. As one old preacher said, it's getting sweeter by the day. It's getting sweeter by the day. Let me, uh, we've got to uh, raise some more money for John David. Uh, we've got a little over half of it raised, so we need about 1900 more dollars. You say, preacher, what's going to happen if we don't raise the money? We're going to send him in. We're going to let him swim, okay? <laughs> we might be there in back time he gets over there <laughs> if he's a fast swimmer, swimmer. So tonight you give, uh, let's raise this and take care of Brother John David. It'd be an experience of, of his life. We, uh, right now, I think we've got four more spots left. We've got 116. We'll have three buses this year. And uh, everybody talking to them, they can't wait to get over there. Uh, it's a, uh, it's going to be it's it's going to be a joy just to watch John David. He's got his Tennessee shirt on. Don't be like Brother Charles Gilmer watching Tennessee football. Yeah. All right, a couple of our men come with receiver giving tonight. Jack. Pray for us, Jack. God help us. Yes. 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 Help us, God, too. Amen. Harvest Sunday, summer harvest, and uh, we can't have a feast without having a what? I mean, a harvest without having a what? So we're going to have a fellowship meal, and the Victory Voices will be with us that Sunday. Now, I'm I tell you what, I'm working. I don't I, I don't believe there's one person in this church to get more here than I do. That's how cocky I am. Huh? I think you ought to get spiritually cocky every once in a while, don't you? We go around like banny roosters on every other thing, don't we? Huh? So uh, I, don't, I don't think there's one of you can. Uh, I'd, almost, uh, I'd almost say I'd give you $100 if you can bring more than I can bring. <laughs> well, I, I tell you what, I'll do it. All right, good. Right there's the one hundred dollar bill. You bring more than me, you can have the hundred dollars. All right, <laughs> don't speak. Well, you want me to let the <laughs> jury hold it? And uh, hey, listen. God gave me a message for Sunday. You think if you got a passion, what's your passion? None of you got a passion. Well, no wonder you look, walk around in in in, in mundane world. Uh, what's them uh, what's them things that uh, mummies? 
Is that a word? How many of you know what a mummy is? Huh? None of you have no don't. There's none of you got a passion about eating. Huh? I mean a passion. Listen, if you was to come up here right now and say, there is a passion. I, I tell you what, life will never be exciting unless you have a passion about something. I mean, you just, you just go through the flow of life, whatever will be, shall be, and there's nothing. Uh, 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 tonight I'm going to ask the question on this. Uh, is your uh, prayer life affecting and how's it sounding in heaven and what's it doing here on earth? So Sunday morning I'm going to preach on what, uh, what's your passion? Five dimensions of a passion. All right, tonight let's look to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus, chapter 30, as we continue the study on the tabernacle. And I promise you, if you will get in an in-depth Bible study about the tabernacle, uh, your salvation and the truth of Christ I believe will be a great joy unto you as you begin to understand all the pictures, the foreshadows, the symbolisms of the tabernacle that is fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. What, let me ask you a question. What would you say is the most dullest book to read in the Bible? Or the hardest? Leviticus. But I'm going to tell you something. The book of Leviticus, every one of those feasts, every one of those offerings and sacrifices, who's it a picture of? Who's it a picture of? Christ. We sing, oh, how I what? Love who? You think if you love somebody, you'd like to hang out and learn more about them? And the more you hang out with them, the more you learn about them. How many of you believe? How many of you believe uh, uh, if, if you're in love with someone, you'll have a passion to show about that one? Can I get an amen? How many, how many have woke up from your afternoon nap? Huh? How many are still there? Huh? You, you know the reason that we, we don't get excited... There was a day, you remember the book of Nehemiah, when they stood for hours and read the book and they wept? Why did they do that? This book meant something to them. How many of you believe if we spend as much time with this book as we do with the sports world? Who shot John? This book would really get exciting to us. How many are ready to study tonight? Amen. All right, let's read about uh, the uh, altar here of incense. How many of you know what incense are? Smelly things. <laughs> Them's bad incense. <laughs> yeah, but what they, they're called, if any of you have read the 30th chapter here, what kind of sweet smelling? Did any of you happen to go over and read Revelation chapter 5 and Revelation uh, uh, number eight, uh, chapter 8 or read Psalm 141 and verse number 1 about uh, the, the prayers of, Entered the saints, the incense of prayers, and entered into the holies of holies. And, and I wonder tonight how the fragrance of my prayer life is, is going up before God. And I wonder how the effect of my prayer life is changing the world around about me. Now let's read the first ten verses here in chapter 30. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. A shittim wood shall thou make it. A cubic shall be the length thereof, and a cubic the breadth thereof. 
Four squares shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof, and the horns thereof shall be as the same. And thou shalt overlay it with what? What are you overlaying? What kind of wood? Shittim wood. What does the wood speak of? The humanity of Christ. What does the gold speak of? The deity of Christ. You know, some people get all hung up on his humanity, and some gets all hung up on his deity, but I'm, believe, I'm glad he's the God man. He's 100% God, and he's 100% what? Man. Look at verse number uh, 3. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof, and thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. And two golden rings shall thou make to it under the crown. That was uh, to put the, the staves, the poles through, to carry when they were moving it. And thou shalt put it before thee, verse 6, the veil uh, that is by the ark of the testimony before the mercy seat that is over the testament where I will what? Meet with thee. How many of you glad tonight you can meet with God? Amen. Commune with God, fellowship with God, know God, and have a personal relationship with God. Verse 7, And Aaron shall burn the, uh, their own sweet incense every morning when he dresses the lamp and he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamp, at even he shall burn incense upon it, and perpetuate incense before the Lord throughout your generation. And you shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifices, nor meat offerings, neither shall you pour drink offerings thereon. And Aaron shall make atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering. Atonement once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout, though, uh, through, throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. Let's pray and ask God to help us to grasp some things tonight. Father, I thank you for the precious Word of God. I thank you for its power, its truth. I thank you for how it transforms our lives when we, we get into it and we see our relationship and our fellowship and who we are and who you are and our purpose for being here on earth and, and then our eternal destination. I pray tonight, Lord, that the precious Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit would illuminate our minds and our hearts. God, just help every one of us for the next uh, a little bit to do everything we can to get our minds off of today, our minds off of tonight and tomorrow, and let us get focused upon the truth of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In His name we pray, amen. Now let's go back for a little review tonight before we get here to this part and understand how that we can pray and what will keep us from praying. This is called the what? The altar of what? Incense. It's, a, it's the place of, of, of our, 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 our intercession, our worship, all going up before God Almighty. But let's go back and review just a moment. The tabernacle. How many of you remember the picture of the tabernacle set up here? Uh, it's been taken back over to the library. But there's a wall. I want to ask you a question. Where were you at? You were outside the wall. The, the, the wall. Outside the law, the law, the wall, you were what? You were lost. Now, 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 how many of us have forgot what it means to be lost? Of course, the Bible say that you have no what? Hope. You have no 
you really have no purpose. I, I mean, life is what? Empty. I want to ask you a question out, church. Would you say the majority of people today that you meet are very empty? Michelle shared a story with me that I wish every Christian could be like this family. And I believe God wants all of us. I believe God put the book of Job in the Bible to help us to understand He's God and His grace and He's powerful enough to take us through no matter what happens in life. Here's this family. They're home. They're far. Three children. Wonderful, wonderful Christian family. The two little girls both have passed. Today, the other girl, the bigger girl, the older girl, they amputated her legs today. Now, I don't know, I don't know how, when you hear news like that, I don't know where, hey, listen, I could be in that place, but I want to be like them. God is in what? Charge. What did we just get through singing? I want to ask you a question. We sing God will take care of us. But many times when the crisis comes, what happens? We act more like an unbelieving world than we do. Let me tell you the power of the church. The world is looking to see how I act and you react in the time of crisis on life. And if they look and see that we fade just like the world, then the thing about it, they say, what's the difference between them and me? So we were outside, lost without God, empty. Remember, we had no hope, and where were we headed after death? To hell. I mean, it's a reality, folks. Hell has not been removed. No matter how much we would like not to think about it or talk about it, I don't enjoy preaching on hell. I really don't. I hear some preachers preaching, mention hell, and it's like they're happy that people are going there. I don't like the I don't like to think about it, but it's a truth and it's a reality. And if I could pull the curtain back from hell and see just a flash for a minute, I believe I'd be a different preacher. I believe every deacon would be a different deacon. I believe every Sunday school teacher would be a different teacher. I believe every youth worker would be a different youth worker. If we could just... I don't believe you could stand to live to look at it for any length of time. I believe it would kill you in our human body to see if you had any kind of conscience at all about you. But remember where we were outside the law, the wall? We were what? Lost, no hope under the condemnation, wrath of God, and headed to eternal condemnation. But there was a door. Who is that door? Aren't you glad for Christmas? How many is glad for Christmas? Not because we celebrate and we have gifts and we have family. How many of you are glad for the greatest gift that ever came from heaven? Jesus Christ, Christmas. God coming. God. You remember who's Mary holding? She's holding God. A little baby. You know, Jesus was born as a baby. You know, Jesus uh, got down and probably played in the dirt as a little boy. And I, I, You know, uh, I got a little grandson, and, uh, and they know how to break Papa's heart when to come to Alabama. They sent a picture yesterday, and here he is on his belly, crawled up under his little wagon trying to fix it. And somebody said, well, why don't he take it to Papa?" But I believe Jesus went through, and, and I believe Jesus, hey, listen to me, teenagers. Listen to me. Did you ever stop and realize Jesus understands what a teenager goes through? Your mom and daddy might not know what it is, but Jesus went through. He was human, but yet he was God. Amen. Aren't you glad for that door? Yes. Jesus Christ. 
You got to go through the door of the tabernacle. If you're going to heaven, get saved. You got to come to the what? How many doors are there? One, one. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man come to the Father except by me. He said, I am the door. And he said, if you try to climb up any other way, you're a thief and a robber, and you know that thieves and robbers shall not have no part in the kingdom of God. So we're going through review right now. We might not get to where I want to go, but we'll go, okay? You come through the door. What's the first thing when you come through the door? In the tabernacle. We've studied this, and we've studied this, and we've studied this. The what kind of altar? The bronze, the brazen altar. What is that? Look at the cross. Where, where was the sacrifice offered? At the altar. If you come in and it's lined up in the door, on this side, it is built up. There's a ramp that comes up. Now, when you're standing at the bottom of the ramp, what... Now, listen, this is as far as the Jewish people, the Israelites, they didn't go to the laven. They didn't go to the holy place. And only once a year, the high priest went into the holies of holies. But it's all a picture now that God is opening up through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ that you and I can come anytime, any place. But here's the ramp. What do you, what, what's, up, what's the center got to bring? A sacrifice. All right, say, say, the center brings a sacrifice. Who's here at the ramp? The priest. All right, now, what does, what does, the, what does the, the, the sinning believer that's come to meet and walk with God and know God, he's brought his sacrifice. What does he do? He lays his hands on the sacrifice. What does the priest do then? And while he's got his hands on the sacrifice, he's confessing, I have no hope to meet God outside of the plan that God has given me to come to him. You'll only come to God God's way. You'll never come to God your way. And God's way was a sacrifice. It's been a sacrifice ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and there was only one ultimate sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ that would die on the cross that would be the eternal sacrifice. This was a, a picture of an IOU until the full payment. And when he made the payment, it's been paid in full. But he lay his hand on the lamb. Then he would confess his sins and repent with godly sorrow that he transgressed against God Almighty. And what would the priest do? The priest then would take and slit the lamb's throat and there would be a basin that they would catch the blood in. And then they would take the animal up and they would lay it on the uh, brazen altar where the, where the flames was coming up. And what would they do? They would burn the sacrifice. But they would take the blood and sprinkle it where? Once a year they went into the holies of holies. But they would take the blood, this happened in the morning's uh, uh, sacrifice, and put it on the rings of the altar of incest that we've read about tonight. You just remember there's no way to get to God without the shedding of the blood. No wonder the devil hates the blood. No wonder the devil has worked to get the blood out of songbooks and get blood out of the churches and get blood out of the men. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. None. No, not one. So then, this is as far as the repentant sinner goes. You understand that? Who goes to the laven and washes? There's more than one priest that is ministering in the tabernacle and ministering in the temple. The priest goes and washes in the laven. What's the laven a picture of? 
of daily cleansing. Each day, the priest ministers work in the tabernacle, and then when the temple comes, they minister there, and one of the, every day they had to go and wash in the laven. What's that a picture of? What happened in John chapter 13? Somebody raise their hand and tell me what happened in John 13. We've got denominations that have a foot washing. John chapter 13. What happened in John chapter 13? They went in, they were sitting, getting ready to dine, and nobody had washed their what? Normally, you go into a place, somebody was appointed, or the least one of you that went in was to wash the other's feet. And they've gone in, and nobody has washed their feet. Who gets up? Jesus Christ. And he girds himself, and he starts washing, washing the disciples. He walks over to Peter and says, Peter, Need to wash your feet. What did Peter look up at him and say? Oh, no, 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 Lord. What was Peter? Peter realized, I should have been down there. I should have been doing what my Lord done. I should have been doing it. And I'm not going to let you wash my feet. I should have been doing it. What Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, man, you can't have no fellowship. Now, what did Peter cry? Peter said, well, Lord, just wash me all over. Listen, listen, what, what, what did the Lord say? He said, Peter, you don't need to be washed all over. You're already saved. What do you need? Boy, can you see this in the Word of God in the tabernacle? You had to be clean and faith and grace. Folks, it's never been by works. It's never been by law. It's never been by deeds. The only way anybody will ever get to God is by grace through faith. And to have that daily fellowship, he's teaching us in the tabernacle. You've got to go to the laven. You've got to get clean. Folks, I'm not talking about tonight getting cleaner. We need to be clean. We need to be clean. We need to be holy vessels, sanctified vessels. We need to be vessels Lord, that's set apart for the glory of God. Listen tonight, folks. God's not looking for vessels of diamonds and golds and silver, but I tell you what God is looking for tonight. God's looking for somebody with a clean, pure heart tonight. Clean, pure heart. All right, now, this is the outer court. Where is the actual tabernacle? The actual tabernacle is divided in two components, the holy place and the holy of holies. Now, you walk into the holy place, and there's three pieces of furniture in. Can you see, can you see the journey here, ch church, tonight? You was out there lost. You came through the door. You have trusted the sacrifice. You've gone to God for confession and cleansing. Now you're going into the holy place. Let me tell you something, folks. If you're not saved and clean, you'll never walk in the holy of holies with the Lord. You'll never walk in the victory. You'll never walk in that that I was talking about a while ago that this family going through. I, 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 there's been a few people in my life that, that, that just, I, I mean, it, you could just see the glory and the power and the, I, I mean, you just see the, when their little world was falling apart. I remember Sister Googe. This just entered my mind. I hadn't thought of Sister Googe in many, many years. But I don't remember Sister Googe. You know what Sister Googe came down with? She came down with a disease of the hardening of her bone. And it got to that she couldn't, she couldn't move. No. Can you imagine that, a disease that actually every bone in your body solidifies till you can't move? And when she was diagnosed with this, she'd come to church. She'd roll in the wheelchair. She got to, she couldn't bend to get in the wheelchair. You know how she come to church? She came to church in a hospital bed. 
And you know, then she cut and come, and I'd go, I'd go, her, her, uh, they were feeding her in her venus and all, keeping her alive the last days. And I would walk in. She couldn't move her jaws. She couldn't move one, one bone in her body. But you could see a smile that would come on her face and her eyes would look up. Folks, listen. I, I believe this is what God wants for I don't know what I'll go through in this life before I check out of here. I, I don't know what in it, but I'm going to tell you something. I believe the song we sung tonight was not by accident or coincidence. I believe it was a divine message sent from God. God will take care of you. Amen. And see, you walk into the holy place. What do we have sitting on the left-hand side? The golden candlestick. Who's the light of the world? Jesus said in, in, uh, in, uh, in what, John uh, 14, 12, I am the what? I am the what? The light of the world. But then he goes on and says, I'm going back. He goes back to uh, Matthew chapter 13, and he said, now, I'm the light, I'm going back. But he said, now, do what? Don't, don't put your light under a what? But let your light so shine that they may see what? Your good works and glorify your Father, which is what? In heaven. What's he saying to them? He said, now, who's the light of the world, church? Listen, listen. If, if, if our hearts would get to that place and understand God wants to turn the 440 spiritually on in our church and our life. Can I tell you something? God's doing some things today. There's some revivals and there's some play. Hey, I was with a group of preachers not long ago, and out of, out of that group of preachers the Sunday before, this is the first time probably this has happened in multitudes of years. 27 of those preachers had somebody saved on Sunday. God wants to do it. But where's the light? Christ in us. But listen, if we've got, li listen tonight. You know sometimes why that, why that we have to go through some tough places? We put, we put a shield over our, over the light. We put a shield over our hearts. We put a shield. We, 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 we put a hood over us. Uh, we become cold. We become different. And we become callous. And when we become like that, then we've lost that glow. We've lost that illumination. We've lost that, that just joy and that, that life of Christ. And people do not see it. And God sometimes has to come along and do something to crack us to get us humble again. You understand what I'm talking about? God can't use a bunch of, God can't use a proud preacher. By the way, I don't believe God's going to use any proud Christians full of arrogance and pride. Can I tell you what keeps you from this book? Can I tell you what keeps you from praying? Pride. You don't think you need it. Folks, I need this word. I need this word. I need, I need, to, and, and I wished, I wished I was going to get to prayer tonight. But I, I got, you got to go back and see this. If you see all of this and you get to the, 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 the altar of the, of the incense, incense, uh, incense prayer, then you're going, you're going to, you're going to see what prayer. And I, I've confessed, and I'll confess to you again tonight, my biggest sin tonight is the sin of prayerlessness. It's my biggest sin. I, I, I pray so little. I went over there to South Korea, and I seen Christians, and I seen them with broken hearts, and I saw them with tears, and, and I, I saw them with, with, with uh, groanings and moanings before God. God, don't leave us alone. God, move in our lives and in our hearts. And then on the right, what have we got? The table of what? Show bread. How many loaves is on that table? There's 12 loaves. What happens 
every Sabbath. Every Sabbath the priest takes them, they bake 12 more, put on there, and the bread is for the priest to eat. Aren't you glad God's given you some heavenly bread? This is bread from heaven, folks. Mm, I don't know about you. I like good hot buttered rolls, don't you? Oh, Lord. Uh, the other night, Brother Ralph come over and had, had dinner with us, and Pat made them yeast rolls. And, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, the next morning, you can get up and put them in the microwave and get them hot and slice them open, put some butter in there and some jam, and you take a bite of that, and your tongue will knock your brains out. If you, I mean, it's so good. Amen. Bread. How many of you know bread is one of the stable foods in the world no matter where you go? Jesus said, I was the bread of life. You know, you can't separate the living bread and the written bread, the living word and the written word. Uh, somebody said, uh, uh, I'd sing, I, I love Jesus. I said, I can tell you two ways you can find out if you love Jesus, if you love his church and if you love his word. If you love his church and if you love his word. And then... We come to our Bible study tonight. The altar of incest. As we read there, it's one and a half feet long, but one and a half feet wide, three foot high, shed them wood covered with gold. And what does God require here? He requires a special incense to be burned. You remember I was preaching on the sin and the death on, uh, on uh, Sunday night? Remember I mentioned to you Leviticus chapter 1, uh, chapter 10, verse 1 through 10? What happened to Aaron's two sons? They were killed. How many of you know why they were killed? They were offering burnt sacrifices instead of the sacrifice that God said for them to use. So this thing of, of, of our life and this thing of, you know, the smell. You know who we're supposed to have the fragrance of? We're supposed to have the fragrance of Christ. Hey, hey by the way, is, is this just not logical uh, if, if, you, if you hang around the barn where manure is at and you walk in the manure, what are you going to smell like? If you go down to a perfume factory and you hang out where the perfume is and the atmosphere and all, and you walk out, how you go, what, who, what are you supposed to smell like? I want to ask you something. What does the Lord want to smell like himself? Sir, has anybody seen Jesus lately? Folks, they're not going to see Christ in this lumber or these pews or this carpet. They're going to see Christ in the people of this church. Amen. Sir, may I present Jesus to you? Oh, Lord. <coughs> Sir, may I present Jesus to you? I remember going to Hammond, Indiana back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, to pastor school. First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. At that time, they were running a little over 20,000 people in Sunday school. Can you imagine a church running 20,000 people? But on Monday night, how many times have I sat there in First Baptist Church and wept and cried and hungered and desired to see what I saw presented there? They go through all the ministries, the deaf ministry, the Spanish ministry, the Korean ministry, the military ministry. They ran buses. They bring, they bring hundreds of soldiers and Navy men into that church, and they had buildings that they rented on all and, and, and places and, and coliseums in Chicago where, and in Hammond where they would bring and have services and teach and preach. And then they pr present the youth ministry, the children ministry, the nursery. Can you imagine a nursery with 300 babies in it? The bus ministry, the musical ministry. And that was, sirs, may we present Jesus to you. What's this ministry all about? Presenting Christ. 
How many of you believe if we just could get to some way showing him, he'd make a difference? Now, there was the special mixture. You can read on down chapter 30, I think it's 38 through uh, 37 through 42, and it tells you what's all in this mixture and all. But then the priest morning and what? Evening. Did you get when we was reading this in the morning, the priest went and he offered the, the uh, offering of incense upon the altar of a morning. And then during the day, to talk about their ministry and all, and then at the evening, there was the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. How many of you remember the time when people used to have morning prayer and evening prayer? How many of you remember the time that families used to get together and pray? How many of you believe we would have had a different world if we'd have kept that practice? I was talking about Pat and I, and Pat didn't marry a preacher, and I got saved. And, and one thing, uh, the other night was talking about Ralph and, and Greg and all of us sitting around the dinner table and talking, and, and, uh, and uh, we were talking about our kids and sending them to school, and, and Brother Ralph's talking about sending his kids off to a legalistic school that that and and one of the teachers just uh, this, I'm talking about a Christian school and took it out on his son because she didn't like him. I'd say that's a heathen. I'm gonna tell you something. You don't like me, don't take it out on my son, okay? But we we were talking all and 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 I remember when I got saved and then of the evening we'd get together. I'd say that there probably none of us not has family altars sitting in this auditorium. Pat and I don't get together and pray like we ought to. Confession's good for the soul, people. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to realize and and and, and we're getting back to this to where Pat and I we sat yesterday and held hands and 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 I'm gonna tell you something. Praying together, it it might have to take her being in the condition she's in right now to break my stubborn heart to get me back to the place I want to be. But I remember through all of those years, every evening before we went to bed at time, we would read the Bible. And folks, listen, we never had, it wasn't a legalistic thing that we made our kids, but our kids wanted to come. And you know what, what my boys grew up understanding we could sit down and talk about any problem they were going through. They knew anything. If they had questions about things, they were not afraid to bring it out and us talk about it. See, a lot of kids are afraid to talk to their parents because they think their parents will jump on them. Hey, they need somebody that will listen to them. And my boys realize we can talk about these things. We'd read the Bible. And we'd, we'd, we'd talk. Let me tell you something, church. There was sometimes, hour and a half later, we would be sitting there still talking. There's not many dads can say what I can say right here. I never had a sleepless night over them three boys. And yet today, I'd rather have the fellowship that I have with my children is to own this whole world and my wife. But see, morning prayer, evening prayer, and then they was talking about ministry in between. What was that? What does uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 say? Pray without what? Pray without ceasing. You say, Brother Roy, does that mean that I've got to go around all the time saying, Lord, 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 do, 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 yes, I want to do, 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 help, do. No. Pray without ceasing means you're in an attitude every step of the way that God's in control and he's with you and he'll help no matter what the need is. I'll share this. We'll pick up Lord's willing. I remember Dr. Howes, the pastor of the church I was telling you about in First Baptist Church, Hammond, Indiana. 
Remember about Dr. Howe's telling about when he left Texas. <clears throat> and he and the deacon had had a fallen out before he left Texas. And he said, I got to have in Indiana. My oldest girl had to have her tonsils removed. Said we took her down, thought it was just going to be a procedure. She'd go in, maybe go home that evening and all. And said they took her tonsils out, and then they said we're going to have to keep her. And they took her to the room, and she started hemorrhaging. Dr. Howe said, I went down to the chapel to get on my knees to pray for my daughter. And when I got on my knees to pray, he said, the Holy Spirit said, you remember the animosity and the feelings that you have before that deacon in Texas. He said, I got up. I went and found a phone. I called that deacon and I said, I called him by name and said, I'm sorry. Forgive me for how I treated you. And what I did, I asked your forgiveness. And the deacon said, you're forgiven. His daughter came through, but two days later, he got on a plane, flew all the way to Dallas, Texas, went and faced that man personally. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. I'm glad when my two boys had a wreck on them, Greenwood Drive, and Chad Coxon called and said, Preacher Roy Matton, he was following them. First time that Matt had ever drove on his own. Drove to school that day, coming down Greenwood Drive. Didn't understand when it got off. He hit a tree right there below uh, uh, Greenwood Drive Baptist Church. And Chad said there, and Pat and I jumped in the car and went up there. And when I saw Matt laying there, covered in blood and all. I'm glad I didn't have to go make something right. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. I've tried to get to the place of every day and I can't be perfect but I want to get this old stinking pride and selfishness out of my life. I'm working on my Sundays, I mean not my Sunday school class, my class that I graduated with in my high school to get them here and I'm in the process of calling them and inviting them that day and getting, getting old friends and acquaintance. I, I walked into a business, uh, I believe it was Monday, and, and uh, I'm grateful that the owner had already talked to his employee about coming to church and, and all. Folks, listen, I don't know how much time I got left. I don't want to waste none of it. I've seen too many hurting lives. I sat this week in counsel with too many homes that are coming apart. I've counseled with too many people understanding what sin is doing in their life. And I sat in the emergency room for almost 12 hours last Saturday and saw the power of sin walk in one after another. If you don't believe you've got a drug problem of overdose in this city, go sit in the emergency room next Saturday or Friday night. You know, the, one of the reasons...